John chapter 12, and I'm going to start at verse 23 and read through 36. Please listen carefully, for this is God's word. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. My soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore the people who stood by heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This, he said, signifying by what death he would die. The people answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Then Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, and that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. So ends the reading of the word. So we see here that God speaks audibly to Jesus for the third time in order to encourage him in his final days of his mission on the earth. The first was at his baptism, and then the second was at his transfiguration. And now we have God the Father speaking audibly to him as he begins his Passion Week. But when you go back to verse 23, it says, But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. So ends the reading. So think about what's being said here. The, the hour of the glorification of Christ is going to be made manifest on the cross. The place of suffering, humiliation, and shame for criminals. That's what the cross would, would conjure up in people's minds. But if you read the scripture, which they did, they were well aware of the scripture, Isaiah 52, 13 says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently, he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. So this is kind of the verse that they had in their mind. The suffering, the suffering glorification was contradictory for many Jews. And matter of fact, in the book of Enoch, the Son of Man is viewed as a, as a powerful conqueror. Now the idea of, of glorification by means of crucifixion, which is one of the worst deaths that the, the ancient mind could uh, conjure up would be difficult for them to understand. It's not what the scripture is saying. The scripture is saying the Son of Man is going to come and, 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 and reign and from a, a Jerusalem. What do you mean he's going to die the worst kind of death you could possibly imagine? And they went, by, they, you get this a lot of literature outside of the canon. So we go by the canon. The canon is the 66 books of the Bible. Uh, Jesus confirmed this twice. In, in the words that we have. The first time is in Luke 6, 44, 45. You go to Luke chapter 6, 44 says, wait a minute, Luke 24, I'm sorry. Luke 24, 44. Luke 24, 44 says, Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all things must be fulfilled which was written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Notice what he's saying. He's saying all things 
uh, spoken of me in, in, in the uh, Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. That's the Tanakh. That's the Bible that they went by in the temple. Tanakh, Hebrew, went by consonants. So it was TNK. When you, when you, if you read original Hebrew, TNK, they added vowels uh, in between the third to seventh century BC, mainly for pronunciation reasons. So it's T A N A K, Tanakh. That's the Bible that they used. Now the Tanakh, he says, uh, that's written to me in the Law of Moses. That's Torah, the T, Torah, it's the Law of Moses. In the Prophets, the Prophets was Nebia in Hebrew, N as the prophets. K, Kephalim, is the writings. So Jesus is saying what's always spoken of me in the Tanakh, which is the 39 books of the uh, Old Testament Protestant canon. They had 22 books, but of course, they had they didn't uh, split Samuel into 1st and 2nd, Chronicles into 1st and 2nd, uh, 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 Ezra and Nehemiah was considered one book. So what the Protestants did, we just split the books and we have 39. But it's the same exact canon that Jesus referred to here is that we go by. Now there's nothing wrong with going by other literature. When we say scripture alone, what we mean is the 66 books is the final and ultimate standard of truth. We, you can go by commentaries, you can listen to pastors preach, you can listen to teachers teach, we go by councils, creeds, we even have a statement of faith here. There's nothing wrong with that. It aids us in, in our faith. But anytime any of those contradicts the 66 books, what's in the 66 books, we need to either reform the place or leave for another organization. Now, uh, Jesus again says the same thing in Matthew chapter 23. You go to Matthew 23, verse 34 and 35, he says, or 30, it's 34, verse 34 says, Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you kill and crucify, and some of them you scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Beccaria, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. So again, Jesus is confirming the canon, the Tanakh, because he's saying from the blood of Abel, which is in Genesis, to the blood of Zechariah, which is in 2 Chronicles. The Tanakh was, went from Genesis to 2 Chronicles, is the last book, and all the books in between. So again, he's confirming the 66 books of the canon. Now go to verse 24 back in John. It says, Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. So ends the reading. So Jesus is likening his death and resurrection and, and its results to a grain of wheat falling to the earth and dying, and that it may bear fruit. If, if the grain of wheat doesn't die, no fruit comes. But if Je So if Jesus doesn't die, no one will be saved. But if the grain of wheat dies, fruit results. You know, Jesus, what did they, Palm Sunday, like last week, they're, they're doing their palms and they're saying, here comes the king of Israel, king of Israel. He could have accepted the kingdom right then and there, right? He could have accepted it. And not have to go through the cross. But what would have happened if he would have accepted the kingship, which is offered to him several times? None of us would be saved. That it would end. The earthly kingdom would end. So Christ had to die for us, for his bride. You know, the an analogy would be the farmer doesn't lose, seed, doesn't lose seed, but gains fruit. Just as God, through the Son, through the God the Son, gains many children who are able to produce fruit for his glory. That's why we have to die to self. That's why Christ died, so that we might live. In verse 25 and 26, it says, He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. So ends the reading. So he's telling us we can't, don't focus on self, but we need to turn our attention to Jesus Christ. That's the kind of life that the Father honors. Beloved, 
mean, we're blessed. Blessed are those who, remember the Beatitudes, blessed is the word, blessed are you because you're born again. Blessed are you. You're blessed. What is Jesus saying in Matthew 16? Blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for the Father is not, it's flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my Father has in heaven. Blessed, because your eyes and ears are open. Blessed are you that God has regenerated you. Blessed are you that you come to church on Sunday and hear the word of God, that you go home out, out of here on, and fear the Lord in your heart, that you're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Blessed are you. That's what he's saying. To serve and follow Jesus means making a radical lifestyle change. You don't do it in your own power. People see it. People see, why in the world is Judy wasting her time coming to church? Why in the world does Connie waste her time reading the Bible every day? The change is real. You don't see it. You know why you don't see it? Be full of pride, for one thing. The reason you don't see it is because, because the more, as like Billy Graham said, the more sin you see in yourself, the closer you come to Christ, the more sin you see in yourself. So we should never have the attitude as, look how I'm growing in grace, look at me. Because the more you grow in grace, the more you come Christ-like, the actual opposite's happening inside, the more sin you're actually seeing in yourself. So, but here's the way, remember last week it was discerning the spirit of God's kingdom? The way of the, of the earthly kingdom is to the rugged lifestyle, the rugged individualism. It, it's going at trying to get power and honor any way you can in this life. Trying to step on people moving up the corporate ladder. That's the discerning of the, that's the spirit of the earthly kingdom. What's the spirit of the God's kingdom? Humility and death. Humility, because you realize what of a sinner you really are. And you're submitting yourself to the king of Israel. You're submitting to him. And death. We're not, talking about, we're not talking about earthly death so much as once you're born again, you, what does Christ say in all the Gospels? Die to self. You have to die to self. The one who loses his life, that loved this life, is the one who's uh, uh, for trying to protect and retain and maximize uh, your purpose in this earthly life. You're doing anything you can to keep your power and authority here in this life. The last thing you want to think about is death. It's the last thing you want to think about. I'm trying to remember who I watched. Oh, there's that Southern Baptist guy on Saturday. He was talking about it. I, I've been accused of being too morbid, talking about death all the time. But he brought up a good point. He was, he was going from uh, uh, the last part of it, I think he was saying Corinthians, I forget. But anyway, he's bringing up a good point, saying we have to prepare, you know, when, when Paul's in jail saying, bring the parchments to me, bring this, and and because and, I'm ready to die, I've run the race, I've run the good race, you know. There's nothing wrong with thinking of getting, preparing yourself for what is going to happen to every single human being, and that's death. Hebrews 9.27, all of us are going to die, and after that, the judgment. And so we have to focus on our life now and preparing ourselves to the day that we do die. But at the same time, we have to die once you receive Christ. So hating our life means consist consistency using our resources to follow Christ. It doesn't mean that we long to die earthly, but we need to turn from our self-centeredness and seek to glorify God. That's what it means. If you want to get technical, the true Christian loves life more than a non-believer. God wants us to enjoy life. God wants us to enjoy being human. We're made in his image. It's sin that makes us self-centered. It's sin that makes us lazy. It's sin that makes us think evil thoughts. So we have to lay aside, I'll say, uh, striving for pleasure and security if it's sinful and seek to serve God freely. And so by releasing the control of our life, we're actually transferring our control to Christ. And that's what brings genuine joy. What does Jesus say? I think it's in Acts 8.32. The truth shall set you free. See, when, you, when you're when you bondage to sin, you think you're free. That you don't have to submit to anybody. That you can live your life any way you want. But it's actually the person that accepts Christ into their life that is truly the free one. You're truly free when you submit yourself to Christ. 
is when you become free. So a person made in the image of God, I'm talking about non-believers, because we're all made in the image of God, this, they, they fail to produce any type of fruit in this worldly life because they don't understand the true purpose from which they were created for. Now the Christian, when we become regenerated, we begin to guard our mind from, from thinking that this life is all that there is. If we think this way, and we struggle with it, but if we think this way, then we, we're not going to live the sacrificial type of life that Christ wants us to live. Now, verse 27 and 28, it says, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So ends the reading. So this, this should jump right out at us when Jesus says, my soul is troubled. And that word is, is he's, we can't comprehend this. This is walking on holy ground here. Christ is sinless. He's doing the Father's will by going to the cross. By becoming, a lot of people died on the cross, don't get me wrong. It's a painful way to die, but that's not the issue. The issue is a sinless God who hates sin is going to become sin. That's the mystery of the cross. That's what we don't understand. The angels, it says somewhere, I think in Hebrews, continually are marveling. A marvel that this God that they worshipped in all eternity, this holy, righteous God that they sing praises to constantly, became a wormly little man and became a sin offering. We can't comprehend that. But God, so God knows when to speak to Christ. What Christ did say, it didn't, this voice didn't come from me, but it came from you. But doesn't he know the right time to... to speak to us in our heart when we're going through something, when, when we're asking for a prayer request. He, we can't, we don't command God to do anything. God commands us. But he loves you so much. You're his bride. You are his. He went and he took, I mean, when I say this, wait, he's a horrible sinner. Just like I am. So is Keenan. So is Joel Paul. Everybody in this room are horrible sinners. We are, compared to Christ. But you know what he did? He took every sin, every evil thought that you had in your mind, it's personal, and he laid it, he, he said, laid on me. And he suffered for that, for all our sins. So your sins don't turn him away. Okay? But let me just say that that. He became a sin sacrifice on that cross. God who knew no sin became sin. And so this, the Son of God that holds the whole universe together was in turmoil because he knew he was going to bear his people's sins. We can't comprehend that. That's why he's troubled. It's not sinful trouble, but he's ready to go to the cross and experience, I can't even do it. Okay, verse 29 and 30, it says, Therefore the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. So ends the reading. The, what's stressing here is the audible voice came from heaven. And, and it's not a vision. It's not inside. It's an audible voice. And yet the thing is, they couldn't understand it. The people standing there could not understand what was being said. They thought it was thunder. And so the, the people could not make sense of the voice of God the Father, even as they didn't understand Jesus when he sat there and taught them, right? They didn't understand. That's how horrible sin is. However, they were held accountable. You were held accountable for your sin. You are held accountable for what the Bible says. You are held accountable for receiving Christ as Savior. And, and when you die, you can't say, I didn't know, because we all know. Now, verses 31 through 33, it says, Now is the judgment of this world. 
Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This, he said, signifying by what death he would die. So ends the reading. So the world's going to be judged in the sense that Satan, the ruler of this world, would be driven out. Because what was his ultimate weapon? Death. And death would be overcome. And that Jesus would draw all people to himself doesn't mean that everyone's going to be saved. Because Jesus already said, in fact, in John 5, 28, 29, let me read that, that not all will be saved. 5, 28, 29. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So some will go to heaven, some to hell. Not everybody's going to be saved. That's universalism. It means that the offer of salvation has been extended to all people, not just the Jews. When God says, for God so loved the world, that was revolutionary to Nicodemus. We were talking to you in John 3. Because the Jewish people thought we were the only special people that God loves. And they even have to become Jewish to become saved type mentality. And now that Christ has come, he's saying, I'm opening the door to the Gentiles. I'm opening the door to the rest of the world. You just don't have to be Jewish. I'm, my gospel is going out to every single person on earth. That's revolutionary to the Jewish mind. God loves the world, not just the Jewish nation. Now the crucifixion and all that it entails is what becomes attractive to those seeking eternal life. I'm, the crucifixion is attractive to us because that's what saved us. It's the atonement that brings relief. Christ took my sin upon me. The Holy Spirit, when he convicts a person of their sin, what do we do? We run to the cross and we receive Christ and his resurrection. Confirming what that God the Father accepted as Christ's sacrifice. People, I tell you, I saw that thing today on TV. There's a lot of organizations that don't want the cross on their buildings because they think it's offensive. They think it's offensive. You talk, it's barbaric. Of course, it's it's offensive. It's a barbaric act that happened, just like the animal sacrifice in the Old Testament. You think about it. That's why they had so much incense going all the time. Not only offering up prayers for, what it, for, 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 to God, but to, to, for the smell of all the dead animals that were completely being butchered. Of course it's barbaric. It should be barbaric because sin is barbaric. In verse 34 it says, The people answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? So ends the reading. There's nothing wrong with the questions they're asking. They should be asking these questions. But to the crowd, for many in the crowd, a crucified Messiah is just abhorrent and unbiblical. For many today, trusting in Christ alone is not enough. We have to add our works. We have to add our merit. For many of Jesus' time, they believed the Messiah would live and reign forever. They were expecting a military conquest leader that would put away Rome and exalt Jerusalem on earth. That he would set up this political earthly kingdom. That's what they were waiting for. So the, the question that's posed by the crowd reveals that they understood what he was saying. What he meant. That I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be lifted up on the cross. They understood he's saying, well wait a minute. The Old Testament doesn't teach the Old Testament does teach that the seed of David will live forever. They, they're acknowledging that. You're saying you're the Messiah and you're going to die. That doesn't make any sense. So it's natural for them to seek for more information. The Old Testament teaches that Yahweh will redeem and rule his kingdom through another David. A human son, but one who is closely identified with Yahweh, with the God of Israel. The coming king will sit on David's throne, Isaiah 9.6. The king though another David, Isaiah 11, 1, is also David's Lord, who shares the divine rule. Remember when Jesus said, my Lord said to his Lord, who was David talking about? 
David saying, it's not me coming back in the flesh. It's my Lord that's coming back with my name. He'll be a mediator of a new covenant. He will perfectly obey and act like the Lord. Again, Isaiah 11. Yet he's going to suffer for our sin to justify many. Isaiah 53, 11. So they're saying, wait a minute, the Bible's saying, you're telling us you're going to be crucified, yet the Bible's telling us that the Son of Man is going to be lifted up, ruling over Israel. We don't understand what you're saying is what they're saying. Well, I want to focus on this before I finish up. He will be a mediator of a new covenant. And this is what he's telling the Old Testament saints. Moses was a mediator. And they had a lot of mediators that came during the Old Testament that stood between them and God. And now what does it say in 1 Timothy 2, 5? For there was one God and one mediator between men and God, the man Christ Jesus. He's the mediator. He's the one that fulfilled all the different mediators that came before him. You know, you go back to Exodus 17, Remember this, when uh, Moses, when the Israel was attacking the Amalekites? I'm going to start at verse 10. It says in 17, So Joshua did as Moses said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And as soon as it was, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other one on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So this is a picture of a human mediator that's weak. Okay, they had to keep propping his hands up. Now we have a mediator of a new covenant that's God. It's Jesus Christ who's always making intercession for us. We don't need another person in between us and the Father. Okay? Kingdom of priests. Now just hear me out here. Exodus 19, 15, and 16. Exodus 19, 15, and 16. Oh, 5 and 6, I'm sorry. It says... Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel, to the children of Israel. All Israel are going to be priests. In the, in the sense, in the Old Testament, is you're, you're, you're going to go to the surrounding nations and... and uh, uh, present your life to see that your life is different than theirs and to point people to the, to the real Messiah. All the whole kingdom, men and women, are considered priests. You had Aaron the high priest and you had the Levites who would offer sacrifices at the temple but they, as soon as Christ came, Christ is our high priest, right? He says in Hebrews chapter 7, he's the one that tore the curtain. Now we have access to to the Father alone. We don't need to go through another mediator. And and Peter says that back in 1 Peter chapter 2, you're a kingdom of priests who glorify God with your actions. And so now we don't need to go to a priest to go offer up sacrifices. Christ is our high priest. That veil has been torn. We come to Christ. As priests, we have access to the Father. As priests, we have access to to the gospel. You're not going to have an excuse on the day you die saying, this is what this person taught me. You, Acts 17, 11, and the Brarians, the Brarians, when they heard Paul speaking, but what did they do? Was Paul taught, teaching them. They went to the scriptures to make sure what Paul was saying was correct. One more. Numbers 15. See, this is important. There's not some elite class of people. You're all the bride of Christ. Numbers 15, starting at verse 37. 
It says, again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the horns of their garments throughout their generations, and to put a blue thread in the tassel of the corners. And you shall have the tassel that you may look upon and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them and that you may not follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined, and that you may remember and do all my commandments, and be holy for your God. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. The tassels were for every single person in Israel to make out of blue thread. Why blue thread? If you go to Exodus chapter 28 and 38, and the priest's garments inside the temple was made of blue thread. He's saying you're all priests. You see, the surrounding nations had only the elite people, either nobility or special elite class of people that were priests and wore tassels. But God's telling Israel, I want everybody to wear tassels. I want everybody's a kingdom of priests to me. Now, before I finish here, uh, again, it's I can't find it. Uh, in verse 35 and 36, it says, Then Moses said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. And he who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. So ends the reading. So Jesus is the light. And so if you're seeking Jesus, your path is going to become clear. If you're seeking Christ. So pray for wisdom. Seek the guidance and teaching of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to grow in your knowledge. And notice what Jesus did here. Rather than answering their question or entering into some type of theological discussion, Jesus tells them enough information to repent and believe, and that they should do that right now. 